Um, so what were we doing? We were talking about <coughs> semi-discrete optimal transport. Uh, and we wrote down an algorithm, or we drew a picture of an algorithm, one of those things, um, that we said, if, if this thing actually terminates, it will give us the solution we want with, to within you know, some tolerance. <coughs> but it was not at all obvious that this algorithm actually would ter terminate, because it just looks like we're taking these regions and we're saying we're going this one, but that causes the other ones to shrink. So then we try to draw that back, but then we shrink the one we just grew. Uh, so does that actually happen? <coughs> OK, so first of all, I think this, this isn't uh, too tricky or anything. Um, this updates do preserve feasibility. We're never going to cause any region to get bigger than we're allowing it to get. right? So one thing that we required was that the measure uh, of any region can never get bigger than lambda i plus epsilon, and that was only for i equal to to n. <coughs> okay, and we had an initial guess that that achieved this, and this is preserved uh, by the algorithm. <coughs> okay. Um, so let's check. Let's say we do an update. So we update wi at some st in some step. Now, the update has ensured that, uh, that this is true at, at this particular box i. Right? We grew the box until until this value lived between lambda and lambda i plus epsilon. So we automatically have that this belonged to lambda and lambda plus epsilon, so that was fine. We need to just worry about when j is not equal to i. OK, so what do we have? Let's choose any uh, y belonging to this set. Let's call it w nu. So the Laguerre cell is under this new updated weighting system. And by definition, what do we have? We have that y minus yj squared minus uh, wj. OK, wj didn't get updated in this step. So the new wj and the old wj are the same. right? The size of the j cell will have changed, but the weight assigned to the j shell cell hasn't changed. Only the weight assigned to the i cell changed in this step. Uh, so this is always going to be less than or equal to y minus yk squared minus wk nu. <coughs> All right, so what happens with this? Either k is not equal to i, in which case this weight didn't get updated either here. It's still equal to its old weight. Or k is equal to i, and what happened? The weight changed. The weight changed by being increased. Right? We always increase the weights. So, so this weight is going to be greater than or equal to whatever it was at the last step. And that means this is going to be less than or equal to same expression, but with our old Waiting system. <coughs> Why is the weight always increasing? So what happened with these cells, right? We picked a cell that was too small, and we said, now in this particular cell, we're going to increase the weight, which causes the cell to get bigger. Right? Increasing the weight always causes the cell to get bigger. So every time we change a weight, we make it go up. It makes that cell get bigger. It makes the other cells get smaller, potentially. OK, so y belonged to the new cell. Uh, we say, well, actually, y also belongs to the old cell, because it satisfies this inequality with the old weights. So y also belongs to the old Laguerre cell. In other words, as we expected, the cell got smaller, right? The new cell is a subset of the old cell. So Lj uh, w old, uh, w new, sorry is a subset of Lj w old, 
Uh, and that means the measure of this is less than the measure of this. And, the, and since we started with a feasible, uh, feasible uh, setup, right, a feasible setup satisfying this everywhere, we're going to preserve that. So we have that our new cells are going to still satisfy the condition that was already satisfied last time. Okay, so the feasibility is preserved. <coughs> okay, that part that part's not too surprising. Now the big question is, what about termination? Does this algorithm ever stop? Right? We know if it stops, it gives us what we want, but we don't know if it stops. So I'm going to do this in a couple steps. I'm going to first ask the question, uh, so what are we updating in this algorithm? What's, what's really the unknowns that we're sol trying to solve for? What's that? W, the weights, right? So I'm asking if the algorithm terminates. I'm going to back up a step and say, what happens to these weights? As we update them, do they converge to something, or do they just keep changing forever and ever? So do the weights. Converge. Will we ever, okay, I'll ask you this. Will we ever get stuck in a cycle where the weights are bouncing up and down and never converging to anything because they just keep oscillating and jumping around? It's always increasing. The weights are always increasing. So what can happen? The weights are always increasing, which means either they converge or they blow up, right? Those are the only two options. So what we need to try to do is to show that the weights can't blow up. If they're bounded, they converge. The weights, all of the weights, uh, each wi is uh, non-decreasing. So if we can find a bound, if they're bounded, they converge. So I'm going to try to make this argument. We're going to actually go over to this uh, poor reference cell that we've mostly been ignoring, right? The Y1 we established as this reference point, and we created this cell L1 that was supposed to be um, big somehow. So we said all of these other cells are supposed to always be a little bit too small, and this other one is supposed to always be a little bit too big, right? <coughs> so I'm going to try to make this kind of argument. So I'm saying these are our cells, so L1, L2, L3, whatever. <coughs> because these guys here were never allowed to be too big, right? That means, and, and you know, the amount of mass we have is fixed. Since these are never too big, this is never too small, right? So this cell somehow can't be too small. If we if we if we shrink this cell, there will be no mass in here, and since the amount of mass in here is bounded below. All of a sudden, we're not going to be able to make everything up. So now, uh, my claim is going to be, if one of these weights goes to infinity, right? we're attaching more and more weight to it. That means this cell wants to grow more and more and more. If the weight in here goes to infinity, it's eventually going to swallow up cell 1. right? So on the one hand, this cell has to maintain a certain minimal size. But on the other hand, if we let this weight blow up, it's going to just overcome cell 1. And, and we, we can't have both of those things happen. So, th so that's the argument that I want to make precise. <coughs> so let's look at cell 1. So let's let y belong to this poor guy that we've been ignoring. Okay, and what was this? This was the set of all uh, y such that y minus y1 squared 
Uh, we set the weight to be zero in this cell, so I don't have to put anything else there. Is less than or equal to y minus yi squared minus wi for all i. Okay, in particular, uh, we can play with this a little bit. So y lives in here. That means y minus y1 squared right, is less than or equal to y minus yi squared minus wi. <coughs> and if we're living in a bounded domain, there's a limit to how big this can get. Right? So if we happen to be in a bounded domain, and you know, as a bounded domain has been important for almost everything we've done this semester. If we're in a bounded domain, this can only get so big. So this is going to be bounded by some big constant that depends on the size of our domain. Okay, so if omega is bounded. Okay, so what happens if this weight gets too big? It's going to be negative. So if this weight gets bigger than this constant, right? And this constant, it, right, it's constant. It's not depending on where we are in the algorithm. It's just de determined by the problem. If this gets too big, this gets negative, which means this set, this set is empty, right? There's no y's that satisfy it. So if um, wi is bigger than m of omega for some i, then L1w is empty. But I've tried to make the argument over here that this set is not allowed to be empty. There's some, by, by, preserving, by preserving this feasibility condition, this is also going to place some limits on how small uh, L1 is allowed to be. So we know that as the algorithm runs, what happens? We can look at the measure of this set. And we can compare it to the measure of all the rest of the sets. Right? If this is a probability measure, then these things total to 1. So this is 1 minus the sum of everything else. <coughs> this, we knew, couldn't get too big. These are all less than uh, lambda j plus epsilon. Our algorithm forced that to be the case. So this is going to be bigger than or equal to, we add up the lambda j's plus epsilon. <clears throat> OK, if we add up all of the lambdas, they have to sum to 1, right? Because we have total mass 1. Here we're not quite adding up all of them. We're missing lambda 1. Uh, so 1 minus all of this should give us lambda 1. So this is lambda 1 minus, and now here we're adding on, up epsilon a bunch of times. So this is going to be just n minus 1 times epsilon. Okay, And this, this is going to be always bigger than 0 as long as we choose epsilon small enough. So is this true? Uh, as long as epsilon is less than uh, lambda 1 over n minus 1. All right, and again, this, is, this quantity over here has nothing to do with the algorithm. This is data. This is how much mass was assigned to this particular Dirac, and this is how many total points we actually had to worry about. Okay? So this means. Uh, if mu is greater than or equal to 0, this is clearly not the empty set. It's never allowed to become the empty set. 
So L1 of W is never the empty set. And if it's never the empty set, that means we can't allow these weights to get too big, right? Letting these weights to get too big would make it empty. So we can conclude that wi is less than or equal to some constant uh, for all i between 2 and n. <coughs> okay, so our weights are always going up. But they can't go up without bound. We've got a, a strict bound on them. And that means they must all converge, right? Anything that's uh, monotone and bounded always converges. So we have W monotone and bounded. And that gives us our convergence. OK, we believe this part, the weights converge. The weights converging isn't quite the same as saying that the algorithm terminates, right? Because the weights could just keep getting arbitrarily close to whatever they're converging to, but the algorithm keeps running. We need it to, if, if the algorithm keeps running, that means uh, at least, at least uh, one of these masses has never gotten within epsilon of its lambda. So that's not good enough. We need it really to terminate. Uh, but we've got a good helper here in saying, uh, there's some control over how much the weights are allowed to change. Our next question is, do we actually terminate? So here the argument that we'd like to try to make is, we know the w's are always increasing. What I want to be able to say is there's a discrete amount that the w's always increase by at least this much. Okay? So if we can find some small value such that w always goes up by that amount. And if the algorithm never terminates, it's going to keep going up by that amount at least. And eventually, it's going to hit this value and keep, want to keep going up. Right? So if we can show that there's a discrete amount that w always increases by, by at least that amount, then we're done. The, the algorithm can't go on forever without running into these bounds. So we need to estimate how much W actually increases in each update. So in any given step, what happens? We find a cell where, where mu is just much too small, right? It's less than lambda minus epsilon. Oh. So mu of uh, liw uh, increases from, let's write it this way, increases from something that's less than lambda minus epsilon to something that's greater than lambda. Right? That's how our algorithm works. Uh, if it's already greater than lambda minus epsilon, then, then we're happy. That's the condition that would let us terminate. So we only update if it's less than lambda minus epsilon. And we always require our update to bring us above lambda. <coughs> So the, the num amount of mass in this cell is going to change by at least epsilon in any update step. So in a step uh, where we update wi, <coughs> okay, the mass in this particular Laguerre cell uh, increases by at least epsilon. 
So what I want to do is just actually a super crude estimate of if we're going to get a mass change of at least epsilon, uh, how much change in W is required to pull that off. Um, and I'm not trying to do anything precise. I'm just, again, trying to come up with a you know, discrete step size and say W must change by at least this much. OK, so here's the idea. Here's my cell that I've decided needs to be updated. This is my Li. Right, and I want to update it, so that's going to cause this to get bigger. And these lines are going to move out somehow. Now this cell was bordered by a bunch of hyperplanes. Um, and there's a limit on how many hyperplanes we can have, right? There's, a, there's n total cells, so there's at most n minus 1 hyperplanes here. Probably there's quite a lot less than that, but there's certainly not more than n minus 1 hyperplanes. So we know this. There are at most n minus 1 hyperplanes bounding this guy. The total amount of mass in this kind of boundary region is at least epsilon, right? Because the total mass went up by epsilon. OK, so I can, you know, I can pick any of these to zoom in on. I could pick one of the sides and zoom in here and look at the mass in here. I could pick a different side, right, uh, and zoom in on the mass in here. Some of these are going to have more mass than others, certainly. Um, but one of them has to have at least epsilon over n minus 1 mass in it, right? If all of them are less than epsilon over n minus 1, we're not going to make up the epsilon mass increase that we need. So at least one of these kind of boundary areas. has mass greater than or equal to epsilon over n minus 1. Uh, let's say it's, it's going to be the region separating Li from some Lj. So over here I have Lj. I'm going to call this region uh, delta Lij. And let's see. Let's label this a bit. I'll call this dj. This is the amount that this particular hyperplane shifted. Uh, and then on the other hand, I have some, some face here. Right? It's, it's, a, it's a line in this 2D picture, but if we're working in a higher dimensional space, uh, it could be something else. But it's going to have a kind of maximal area to it because our, our domain is bounded. So we'll call this, I'll call this AJ. And just keeping in mind, it may not be a length. It may be an area or a volume or something, depending on what dimension we're in. Okay, uh, I'll let A omega be the maximal cross-sectional area of the domain. So that means uh, this distance here, AJ, is going to be bounded by A omega, right? Because it, it lives inside the domain. I'm just trying to come up with kind of crude estimates on all these dimensions. 
so that I can make an estimate on how far the hyperplane moved. If I know how far the plane moved, then I can estimate how much W must have changed. OK, so this d distance or area or whatever it is is bounded. <coughs> uh, the, the total change in mass in here is, is related to the change in the size of this region, but also to what the density is in here. Right? You know, if the density is 0 in here, then you, you can move this as far as you like and not get a mass change. Uh, so it, it's going to matter a little bit how much the density changes. So I'm going to let rho max be equal to uh, the maximum of rho, or let's call it the supremum. Okay, and then I think we're probably in business to estimate uh, some of these objects. What is row again? A row was uh, the density of the source measure. Is that not the notation that I used before? Or did I not write down a notation for this? Yeah, I think I said it has density rho. Right, so we had, right, we had we were the semi discrete problem. So one of our measures has a density, and one of them was a bunch of Dirac's. So rho is the density of mu. All right, let's estimate these objects. <coughs> so what do we know? We knew that epsilon over n minus 1 uh, was less than or equal to the total amount of mass in this, in this region. Right? It doesn't have to be true for all of these regions, but it's true for at least one of them, and maybe more than one. Uh, so this is mu of delta Lij. <coughs> OK, again, mu has density rho. So this is equivalent to integrating rho over this, over this little strip. And now I'm just going to come up, put crude bounds on this integral. Uh, rho is bounded by rho max. Uh, this little strip here is going to be bounded by aj times dj. And we said, actually, the a, we could bound uh, independent of j. Okay. So at this point, it doesn't matter what step I am in the algorithm. It doesn't matter which one of these cells I'm looking at. The hyperplane always, at least one of the hyperplanes, always moves by a distance greater than or equal to this divided by this. Right? And all of that just depends on data in the problem. None of it depends on where we are in the algorithm. So dj is always bigger than or equal to, uh, let's just call it some constant times epsilon over n minus 1. And again, this is just dependent on data in the problem before we ever started trying to solve it. All right, so there is going to be a kind of lower bound on how much uh, the Ds are allowed to change. And that is directly related to how much the weight actually changed. All right, so changing the weight, increasing the weight, just shifts this. Right? And it's completely proportional. The, the change in the weight is completely proportional to how much this actually shifts. Uh, the constants of proportionality are going to depend on you know, how close the y's are to, to each other and things like that. But again, it's data in the problem. Okay, so the change in d, change in let's how, uh, the distance the hyperplane moves, 
is going to be proportional to the change in the weight. So, in other words, the change in W is going to be proportional to this D. Again, the, pro the constants of proportionality are, are going to depend a little bit on I, which I and J you happen to be looking at and things like that. Um, but there's bounds on all of those things because there's only a finite number of I and Js to look at. And, and these constants just depend on you know, the location of YI relative to YJ, for example. And then those are fixed. We don't get to change those. In other words, WI must increase by at least, let's call it C tilde, it's a different C, epsilon over n minus 1, right? Where C tilde just depends on the problem data. Okay, so let's say we take k steps. What do we have? Uh, well, we have that this constant that we started with okay, so the total change in W is always less than this constant. And this change in W is going to be uh, greater than or equal to k times the minimal change size. So c tilde k epsilon over n minus 1. All right, so this puts a bound on k, the number of times we've updated wi. It's k. It's going to be less than or equal to something on the order of n minus 1 over epsilon. This is the maximum number of times I'm allowed to update each weight. Okay, so each weight can only be updated at most that many times, and then we're not allowed to touch it anymore, because if we do, we'll run into this bound, and we're not allowed to run into this bound. Um, there's finitely many weights that we're trying to compute. There's n minus 1 of them that we're updating. So that means there's a maximum number of steps this algorithm is allowed to take. So the algorithm itself is going to terminate in something on the order of, okay, uh, that's the max number of steps per weight. There's n minus 1 weights. So we have order n squared over epsilon steps. And that's our convergence result, right? We know that once it terminates, the fact that it terminates means that all of the mu's are bigger than lambda minus epsilon. The feasibility is preserved. All the mu's are less than lambda plus epsilon. So that means we've come within epsilon uh, of, of actually solving this optimal transport problem, and that's what we wanted. So therefore, algorithm uh, converges to a solution 
uh, with right all of these minus uh, lambda being less than epsilon for i equals 2 to n. <coughs> Uh, and I think it was something on the order of n epsilon or n minus 1 epsilon for the first one. Uh, any questions on that? It's a very geometric argument. It's a very geometric method. It's really based on a, a very geometric definition, actually, of weak solutions of Morgan pair. Um, very similar to you know just trying to compute these Alexandrov solutions. You can you can think of it that way. Um, um, but this, okay, it may not be fast. You know, if you have a large number of Dirac's and you're trying to hit a small tolerance, you know, say epsilon is on the order of um, 1 over n, right? Then, okay, this, this might not be fast, but it's very robust. Um, and this really was one of the first, if not the first, methods out there for trying to numerically solve Mojan pair. Um, I think the original paper was solving it with like n equals 20 or something like that which sounds horrible now, but in the 80s, you know, they didn't have the computational power that we had, and, and this is not the fastest method out there. Uh, so this was basically the Olicker and Pressner method. I think it was 88. But Jimmy thinks we can do better here. He would like to us, us to try to maybe do some kind of gradient flow algorithm or something like that. Uh, and it turns out you can, and it actually works really well. Uh, it's using the same kind of ideas. So it's still the same problem, the semi-discrete problem, where he says we're trying to construct these Laguerre diagrams. Right? The whole, the whole problem comes down to let's construct these weights. Once we have the weights, we construct these Laguerre diagrams. These cells define a map T, and this map T is optimal. So we're still solving the same problem, but we'd like to do it in, in a more efficient way than yeah. kind of just wiggling things one at a time back and forth. So we want to try to build a faster way, and maybe a less geometric, let's tweak this and then tweak that kind of way. Um, let's try to put this in the framework uh, of more traditional numerical analysis or optimization where we have lots of tools uh, at our disposal that we can use, lots of fast algorithms at our disposal that we can use. Uh, so let's try to look a little bit more at the real quantities that we're trying to deal with. So we, we know we need to work with characterizing these Laguerre cells. Uh, so let's look a little bit more at the terms that show up in the Laguerre cells. Right, these were things of the form no, uh, x minus yj squared minus wj. Or, right, if t happened to be a map from our domain onto our set of points, We could think of these in terms of x minus t of x. Okay, t of x lands on one of the yj's. 
minus the weight function evaluated at, again, the same yj. <coughs> right, this was the terms that were really important. Uh, it's true for all x. So let's try uh, integrating all of this over x. Uh, this term, this term we know is something that has showed up a lot in optimal transport. Um, if we're going to integrate, it's reasonable to integrate this against our measure mu, right? Because that's the term that always shows up when we're trying to do optimal transport. So I'm going to define a function that depends on two things. It depends on a map, any map that lands on my points, and it depends on a particular weight function or weight vector. Okay, so you're my weight, my weight function, my weight vector is basically defined at just these Dirac points. So let's define this guy. F of W and T is, and I just integrate this over my domain against mu. Okay, and this is defined for mappings t that do this, okay, and for weight functions that take the set of points onto real values. All right, I can rewrite this a little bit because you know, this takes on finitely many values. It can only take on n values, this weight vector. So I can also write it as uh, f of wt equals, okay, this is our kind of normal optimal transport term, minus, okay, and then here, what do we do? We integrate this. Let's see, we are going to add up over all the different values of wj that we hit, and then we have to integrate over the region where t of x is equal to yj uh, d mu x. Right, so all I'm doing is I'm splitting this integral up into the places where w is equal to w1, the places where w is equal to w2, and so on. Uh, and in those regions, obviously, you know, w is a constant. Uh, in that region, I pull it out, and then I have to integrate over the regions where w is equal to w1. That means t of x has landed on y1. Okay, simplify this down a little bit. Okay, wj, and then I have the measure of the set of x's where that's true. Oh, that's really t inverse of yj. Okay, we've kind of seen this operator before, and we saw there was a particular map that minimized this. So let's just suppose we fix W for a second. Okay, so treat W as a constant. You've given me a weight vector. What map should I put in here to make this as small as possible? The Berry Center. It's not quite that. I don't know. I don't know exactly what you mean by the Berry Center in this context. The Berry Center of what? Okay. It's okay. <laughs> 
We've actually seen pretty much this expression before. Do you remember what map minimized it? So we gave that map a name. We called it TW. It was our optimal transport map that, that showed up in this problem, right? Uh, so remember, we defined a map TW uh, such that right, x minus TWx squared minus uh, the weight function at this point. right? So TW was one of the y's. And this was the corresponding w. So that this was less than or equal to x minus yj squared minus wj for all j. Right? In other words, tw, we, we looked at x and we said, which the Gare cell is he in? And we, we assigned it to that Dirac point. That's how we defined this map tw. Right? And that minimizes this quantity pointwise. Right? And that means when we do the integral, this is going to minimize the value of the integral. Okay, so when we integrate, uh, if we do, so let's say this, and the minimum overall t of f of wt is going to be just f of w and TW. Um, so <clears throat> I'm kind of minimizing this in pieces. I can define this now as a function of W. Right? And, and it's a well-defined function of W. This, this minimization gives me a well-defined function of W, and we knew that because we actually wrote down the minimizer. Okay, so we can define g of w to be the minimum over all mappings that do this of f of w and t. Right, and we know, like we just said, this is the same as if we put in this mapping TW that we came up, that achieves the minimum. Uh, and now we can put it into this expression. <coughs> so this is going to be x minus TW squared integrated against mu minus We add up these weights. Okay, so TW inverse of Y, right? is a set of all points that get mapped to y. And, and, and this is a region. It's not point-wise. Um, what's the shape of this set of points that get mapped to y? It's the Laguerre cell, right? So Tw was defined to be the map that came up in this definition of the Laguerre cell. So in other words, this quantity here, all the points that get mapped to yj was, by the definition of this t, was the Laguerre cell. That's how we define the T. OK, so we have now this quantity, Wj, and then the measure of these Laguerre cells. 
All right, so g is a function of w. It's kind of a complicated function of w because you know w comes up kind of implicitly in this map in a non-obvious way, but, and then it comes up in an easier way here. <coughs> um, but can we say anything about the shape of g or the structure of it? Uh, as a hint to that, I would say it's very hard to read out of this line. This is complicated, but it may be less hard to read out of this line, just to say this is a minimum of a bunch of simpler functions of w. Right? So g is a minimum, g is a function of w, is a minimum of a bunch of these functions. So how do each one of these depend on w? Yeah, there, it's, it's, it's an affine function, right? This is constant, and this is a linear term in w. So each one of these, each of these f's is a really simple function of w. So we know that each f w t is affine in w. That's almost as simple as we could possibly hope for. Now, g is the minimum of a bunch of affine functions. What can you say about, about the minimum of a bunch of affine functions? Well, let's draw some. So g is the minimum of affine functions. So affine functions are straight lines or hyperplanes or whatever. There's one, and there's one, and there's one, and there's one. Maybe there's one. G is the minimum of all of these. What can you say about G? It's concave, exactly, right? We've seen this before the other way around. We've taken convex functions and said we can write them as you know, the supremum of a bunch of supporting hyperplanes. Uh, this time, we're writing this as the minimum of a bunch of hyperplanes, so we're going to get uh, the flipped picture. We're going to get something concave. So G is concave. I would never have guessed that looking at this line, that this is a concave function of w. Uh, but if you write it in a clever way, it comes out very easily. Uh, what can you do with concave functions? You can maximize them, sure. Right? If you're going to maximize a function, um, you're pretty happy if the function happens to be concave. So we can certainly try to maximize a concave function. Okay, so at a maximum, right, we're going to expect that the gradient vanishes. Right? And, we don't, and, and that's good enough for optimality. We don't need second derivative tests or anything like that because it's concave. Right? If we can find a point where that happens, we can say, boom, this is a, a maximizer. We're done. OK, so we need the gradient of g. Um, again, if I look at this line, I don't really want to take the gradient of g because w shows up here in very non-trivial ways. But if I look at these component f's, I don't really mind taking the gradient of these with respect to w, right? Because it's just this linear dependence in w. So we, again, we need to use this structure. This is the structure that let us pull out the fact that this is concave. This is the structure that's going to let us take a gradient. Um, and we've done this before for convex functions. So you know, let's say, let's say I want to take the gradient of this. Uh, at, say, this point here. So I go up here and I say, what's the value of g? The value of g is here. 
that happens to land on one of these hyperplanes, right? And the gradient of g at this point is just going to be the gradient of the hyperplane at this point that I happen to have landed on. Similarly, if I want the gradient here, I just need the gradient of this hyperplane, right? So we just need to replace the gradient of g with the gradient of one of these f's, the appropriate f, the, the f that we happen to be sitting on at that point. Okay, we've done this before. This was Danskin's theorem, basically. So this is going to say that the gradient of g at w is equal to the gradient of f with respect to w at the appropriate value of t, right, where t star is such that g is equal to f. Right, so t star is indexing which hyperplane we're on. So all this is saying is, let's find the hyperplane where g is equal to f. It's, it's equal to one of them. Uh, t star indices that, and then it just says, now we just need to take the gradient of this guy, and that gives us the gradient of g. Okay, um, we know we know what t star gives us equality here. The t star that gave us equality was was this mapping here, t w. So what we really want is the gradient of g is equal to the gradient of f with respect to the first component of w evaluated at tw. Okay, and this is just evaluation. The gradient doesn't care that there's w in here. We're plugging that in after the fact. So we need the gradient of f with respect to w. <coughs> um, that's easy here, right? This just is equal to negative the mass of the appropriate Laguerre cell. So df by dwi is equal to minus mu of the Laguerre cell. Uh, maybe I'll take this in two steps. This is not always true in general. In general, this is true. But when we plug in TW, so DG by DWI equals this at TW. And this is where we got our Laguerre cell from. Okay, so we've got a concave function. We're trying to maximize it. That means we're trying to set the gradient equal to 0. So if I set gradient of g equals to 0, that implies that each one of these Laguerre cells has mass 0. Uh, how does that help us? Yeah, you're absolutely right. It doesn't help us. That's not what we want, right? We have a constraint on what we want these to be, right? We want the mass in each of these Laguerre cells to be precisely equal to the mass at the corresponding Dirac. That's lambda i. So this is not that useful as it stands. and We've got to tweak things a little bit. But what is useful is that somehow maximizing this function causes, causes this term to come out. And this term is actually important. We, we need to work with this term. So we actually want... We actually want this. Which means we need to change g a little bit to achieve that. So I wanna, what we want to do is change g a little bit. We've got, we've got kind of the most complicated part of g down. All this part that when we take the gradient of it, we get something useful popping out. Now we need to modify g a little bit, add something to it, hopefully simpler. 
so that now when we take the gradient, we'll get, OK, minus this plus a lambda i, and then set that equal to 0. So let's try to modify g a little bit. So let's modify g. Uh, I need to modify g in a way that I don't break the concavity, right? Because if I break the concavity, then I'm not, then, you know, gradient equal to zero is no longer a guarantee that I'm at a maximum. So we need to uh, be careful. Uh, so let's try to do something like this g of w plus. Okay, something that depends on w, in, and we want it to depend on w in a simple way. It has to be a simple way that doesn't break concavity, and where we can easily take the gradient. <clears throat> um, the easiest way to do that, can you think of the easiest way to do that? Yeah, let's just add a linear term, right? Why do something complicated when we could do something easy? So let's try this. Something of the form ciwi. OK, this is still concave. Concave plus linear is concave. So h is concave, right? So that means grad h equals 0 implies uh, w is a maximizer of h. <coughs> and we can easily compute the gradient of this thing. h by dwi is going to be equal to okay, the derivative of g. The derivative of g, we know what that is. That's the minus the measure of the Laguerre cell. k plus, and now just a constant term. Um, so what should my c's be? The c should be lambda, right? So if we take c i equal lambda i, then what happens? Then w uh, being a maximizer of h, is going to be equivalent to the gradient of h equals 0, right? Because we have a concave function. That's all we need to check. And we know what the gradient is. So this is precisely equivalent to the condition that mu of l i w is equal to lambda i for all i. OK, and what does this condition say in terms of optimal transport? Yeah, it's a feasible solution. This is equivalent, right, to basically to saying that the map TW pushes forward mu into nu. This was our feasibility condition. And we know that maps of this form are automatically optimal. So this is another way to look at our semi-discrete optimal transportation problem. Right? We, we know we did the background and we said it's equivalent to saying we need to find this set of weights. Once we have the set of weights, we can construct the Laguerre diagrams. And there's fast algorithms for doing that. Once we have the Laguerre diagrams, we've got the map. The map is defined basically trivially out of those. 
Uh, and here's another way to do it. Another way to do it is to say, well, we could instead look for a maximum of, of this concave function. So this is basically the conclusion of this work. If we consider this concave function, okay, so h of w was x minus tw integrated against mu plus, well, we added in this uh, lambda i w i. We had uh, before in here, in, lived in g, a minus mu of li. Okay. Finding the vector w that maximizes this is completely equivalent to solving the semi-discrete optimal transport problem. So maximizing this is exactly equivalent to doing the semi-discrete optimal transport. Right, but instead of this being, you know, a very specialized, you know, geometric method where you're kind of running in there and trying to play with hyperplanes one at a time, uh, this falls in a large field of study that a lot is known about, right? Concave maximization, or equivalently, convex minimization, right? There's lots of tools out there for doing this efficiently. You know, we're in luck here. We can easily compute the gradient of h. We know exactly what the gradient of h is. We wrote it down, right? It just came down to uh, looking at um, mu. Yeah, we wrote it down here, right? The measure of the Laguerre cell plus the lambda i's that were data. So what do we need to do? We need to be able to evaluate that. That comes down to computing Laguerre cells, right? Which is a similar to comp problem to computing Voronoi diagrams. There's fast methods for doing that, you know, just off-the-shelf black box solvers you can use to do that. Um, so we can compute this fairly easily and do a little bit of quadrature. Um, and, and then, you know, we can compute the gradient easily, so that's good. You can feed that into a, an optimization routine, use that to do gradient descent, for example. Uh, and, and there's actually a really fast implementation of this for the 3D problem, which I think I put this paper on, on Canvas. Uh, so Levy uh, has a fast implementation in 3D. But yeah, it's basically using now standard routines for doing concave maximization, which, again, we, lots is known about. Any questions? You're not convinced this is much better than the previous one. Why? You still need to find the Laguerre cells, yeah. Um, so the, computing the Laguerre cells wasn't the hard part of the last method. What was really the hard part was that a lot of iterations were potentially required. So you certainly need to compute the Laguerre cells at each iteration. Um, but again, there's, there's fast, like order n, log n, I think, methods for doing this. Um, so the, I would say the per iteration cost is probably not much different here. But you should be able to drastically reduce the number of iterations. And you know, something like the other method we had, maybe on the order of n cubed iterations for convergence. Here, uh, you can speed that up a lot here. Uh, actually, take a look at the paper. It's on Canvas, and there's some really impressive results in there. <laughs>
Any other questions? That paper? That paper, yeah. It's on, I don't remember the title off the top of my head, but I posted it on Canvas. Uh, so that's, uh, last week we did some, a little bit of numerics for discrete o OT. Uh, this week we did a little bit for semi-discrete. Uh, and then next week we'll look a little bit at the fully continuous problem uh, and what we can do there. Uh, but I'll stop here. <laughs>